I wasn't getting out of bed. I wasn't going to work. I hid my problems from everyone. I didn't want people to judge me. I watched my daughter suffering. I didn't know what to do. Because you joined the conversation, we know we are not alone. We are not weak. We are not ashamed. We are strong. And help is out there. We need to ask for it. Join the conversation. Visit letstalkstigma.org. Hello, I'm Kraus Schallhorn, board member for the Erie County Anti-Sigma Coalition. And I would like to welcome you to the 10th in our series of Facebook Live events, this time focusing on the state of stigma. Athletes open up about hidden stressors. In our society, athletes are expected to perform at very high levels, while at the same time withstanding the pressure associated with their sport. In recent years, more athletes have opened up about their own mental health challenges, including Michael Phelps, Naomi Osaka, and Kevin Love. This past summer, Olympic gymnast Simone Biles took an unprecedented approach to manage her own mental health by withdrawing temporarily from the games in order to manage her own emotional well-being. But it's not just professional athletes that face these challenges. Those in college, high school, and even younger face issues that are compounded by the stigma of mental illness, which affects our ability to ask for help. So today we're going to be exploring this topic with three individuals who have different perspectives. Before I introduce our panelists, I just want to share with you a couple of housekeeping rules. Our program is for one hour, and during this time, if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the chat box and we'll try to respond accordingly. Today, I'm joined first by licensed mental health counselor, Anne Nowak. She's the director of the Sweet Home Family Support Center, where she's been in this role for 22 years. The Family Support Center is a school community collaboration supporting needs of students and families, primarily assisting in getting access to mental health services. Prior to that, she was a child and family therapist at the Beeman Clinic in Lockport and a residence director and social worker for Baker Victory Services. Anne has a master's degree in school counseling and educational leadership from Canisius College. Next, we're joined by Kelly Piper, who is the assistant athletics director and sports psychology consultant for the University of Buffalo. She also works with private clients across various age groups and sports. Kelly provides dynamic and innovative sport psychology services across various age groups, skill levels, sports, and activities. Kelly works in private practice with teams, coaches, parents, and individual athletes to develop critical mental toughness and wellness skills set for peak performance in sport and in their life, as well as navigate the vastly challenging changing world of sport participation. Kelly earned her Master of Education degree in Sports Psychology from Temple University in 2001. As a collegiate swimmer who experienced injury, Kelly developed a passion for the psychological aspects of sport and has dedicated her career to helping athletes reach their full potential. And finally, we have Nicoletta Antonio, captain of the UB women's tennis team. Nicoletta is a senior in psychology with a counseling minor at the University of Buffalo. She's from a small town in Greece called Volos. Nicoletta is a psychology honors student and currently serves the athletic department at the University of Buffalo as a student athlete advocate for mental health. In the past year, she has created a mental health boost program for her team focusing on conversations around topics around self-care, stress, coping mechanisms, dysfunctional behaviors, and sports culture, in hopes that this program could potentially aid the rest of the student body soon athlete body rather in the future. So welcome all of you to our, our uh, program. And I want to just uh, start off with a question for all of you. So, and maybe we'll just start with, with Anne. Um, for your perspective, what are the pressures you see that athletes face uh, today that affect their mental health? Well, I think that um, the kids are coming out of a pandemic over the last two years where their lives were turned upside down, where education um, did not look the way that they had normally been participating. And now coming back this year, fully in person, they're having to reacclimate academically, socially, um, and 
still be an athlete and still do all of the things that um, are expected of them. So there's a lot of pressure on them um, to perform in all aspects of their life and be okay. And I think that um, has increased, um, you know, the stressors tremendously, the anxiety tremendously, especially on our athletes, because it's one more aspect um, to their life that they have to perform. Yeah, and I remember really at the beginning of the pandemic when uh, COVID began, there was all the lockdowns and students can't even gather. So you talk about elimination of sports practices and so forth. They really missed out on a lot of those activities. Yes. Um, Kelly, how about you? What, do you, what, do you, what would you say some of the athletes, uh, what do they face? So I would, um, first, of, first of all, I would start out by saying, depending on um, the stage of life of the student athlete, some of those stressors can vary. So youth sport um, is vastly different than it was um, when we were growing up. And, um, you know, in many ways, it mirrors collegiate and professional sport. And, um, you know, the amount of recruiting that can happen, um, you know, the pressures that youth athletes may face, the expectations, um, some of the social media um, messaging that they receive, so um, the purity of sport participation and, you know, young athletes, um, you know, choosing to engage in various sports just for the fun of it, the camaraderie, the team atmosphere is not necessarily um, as simple as it used to be, which can create a lot of pressure um, and its own mental health challenges. At the high school level, I think um, to Anne's point about um, COVID over the last few years, when we do have student athletes who um, are reaching um, for the goal of going to college and participating in athletics, there's really been a log jam over the last couple of years in the recruiting process because of um, how COVID has impacted um, collegiate athletics. And um, so that has been really challenging for families um, and for high school student athletes as well. And then at the collegiate level, the NCAA is continuing um, to change, you know, from year to year as far as the expectations for student athletes and, you know, um, what their daily lives look like. But I think um, one specific thing I would add around mental health is, you know, many of our student athletes get to the college level and it's not necessarily what um, they didn't know what to expect. And so it's much more challenging um, and much more of a grind. Um, it can feel like a fishbowl a lot of times that there's eyes on them and expectations that they didn't necessarily expect when they walked in um, to the collegiate level. That's interesting because, you know, when you think about the college level, uh, many people would assume that they're prepared. They have those um tools or, or even abilities to withstand those pressures they say, oh you did it in high school why can't you do it here even though it is i don't want to quite say it apples and oranges but it really is a lot different you might have been the the star athlete in high school then you get to the college level and all of a sudden you're just like everybody else and so that and it itself adds its own pressures am i right nicoletta what do you think yeah i think there was um a big thing for me as well, especially coming from another country for international student athletes, that's a completely different story because you are coming to a new place that you don't know a lot of people. You have to transition into a new environment. That's a pressure by itself. And then the fact that perhaps in your city or in your high school, you were the star, you were the star athlete, everybody knew you, but now you're coming and you, you don't have to compete against your team, but maybe sometimes you even have to, to get play um, in the field or in the court during the match. And that's not something very enjoyable. But um, another thing that's really important that uh, Kelly mentioned is social media. And I remember even uh, when I was back home, if I had a rough weekend and perhaps I didn't get a win, nobody would know about it if I would go to school. But now if I get not maybe a win, Maybe there's going to be an article about it that I lost and everybody will know. So there comes another expectation that people will know about your failures as much as your successes as well. And there's so much pressure just outside of sports of what the athletic life is supposed to look like. And when people are hearing a different story than what, than what they expect, maybe it's really difficult to comprehend that, that perhaps it's not as perfect as it looks because it comes with a lot of struggles. That's a great point. I like what you said there, Nicoletta, about the media. Of course, media itself, you're almost in a fishbowl, right? You feel like you have to perform and you've got certainly the school media outlets, you've got the school papers, and then you have 
the the local papers and then the city papers and and it goes on from there and then you have you know tv and other media that focuses on athletes college athletes that perhaps wasn't being done many years ago. So there are a lot of these things going on that are present more. And that is definitely that social media piece, which I think adds a whole other element to everything we're talking about here. Um, so Kelly, as, as your bio reference, you talk about mental toughness. Um, so how would you really define that in terms of what it means? And, and so how does the athlete develop the mindset to, to become mentally tough? Mm -hmm. So I define mental toughness as consistent excellence. So for an athlete to be able to develop the skills necessary to show up for themselves every day. And that's an individualized process. So what's excellent for one athlete may look a little bit different day to day than, than for another athlete. Um, and the first step of that is really self-awareness. So again, kind of regardless of age, right? But as a student athlete kind of continues to move up to various competition levels, um, you know, that expectation is that they're going to show up with the consistency that they need, even on the tough days, to be able to perform. And that can be really challenging because we're all human, right? We're humans, not robots. So um, to be able to sort of develop a toolbox that, you know, athletes can feel like they have a locus of control for reaching for the tools that they need um, on the days when it's not naturally there, the motivation, um, the energy may be a little more challenging that day to be able to pull from the coping skills, um, you know, and their own self-awareness to be able to show up and kind of find what they need every day. Okay, so you use that term locus of control. I, I, I know what that means. I think uh, some may know what that means. So what's locus of control? So, you know, for an athlete to be able to feel like um, they have the tools internally to be able to control for the version of themselves that's going to help them find success. Um, and regardless of the situation, so whether they're home or away, how practice went the day before, how their body's feeling, if they may be struggling with illness or injury, academic stressors, what's going on at home, all those external pieces that they have the tools to be able to control for how they show up every day kind of tune out distractions. One other quick question. This is more of a, you know, kind of your consultant role outside of the university. What age ranges do you work with? About fifth grade or so, all the way up through high school, college, professional athletes, and um, really any performance related arena. So music, theater, dance, um, okay. high performing people. Wow, that's a, I can't imagine fifth grade and already you're you know engaging those services to understand. I I, mean, I I understand the need, but that's just pretty impressive that that someone's already working with you at such a young age to develop. Uh, you talk about that mental toughness. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, so I just want to remind our viewers that if you have a question, you can type it into the into the chat box, and we'll try to uh, get your answers or get you some answers from our panelists. So um, and. We know that high school is a really challenging time in general for youth, right? It's a time when they are developing mentally and emotionally. Um, so what do you see as being some of those issues they have facing in terms of that maturity when you talk about athletes in particular? Like, what are, are there any distinctions perhaps they might be dealing with that perhaps their peers, other peers wouldn't be dealing with that are in the high school setting? Well, I think that in talking to some of the kids uh, that I work with that are athletes, you know, they talk about just being, um, they talk about being tired and exhausted and drained both mentally and physically because they have all these different things that they're having to juggle in their life. They're having to juggle academics, they're having to juggle home situations, they're having to juggle practice schedules and games and be, you know, be on. Um, and especially those kids who have those higher expectations for themselves to always be on, always perform, always do well, not disappoint people. Um, and you have kids that already have that, even if they're not an athlete, but then you add that extra layer to being part of a sports team, to wanting to do well, to, um, you know, not only, you know, not disappoint your parents, but now you're not wanting to disappoint your coach and you're not wanting to disappoint your teammates. And, and when you maybe don't have your best game, 
um, or you don't do as well as you would like to do on the field. Now you feel like you've let more people down in your life. So it's a lot to manage. Um, kids in high school, as we know, developmentally, they're still trying to make their way. They're still trying to, trying to develop who they're, they are and their sense of self and learning coping skills because they're in that in between, between being a kid and being an adult. And, um, you know, as was pointed out, the social media piece that, that affects all teenagers so significantly is now an added factor to that. So um, I do hear from those athletes that those expectations are very high. And, and especially more with our male athletes, you know, because again, you have those gender stereotypes for male athletes and how they have to perform and, and how they um, are supposed to be strong. So that's definitely um, a lot of those things that are, that are on their plate. Yeah, you talk about juggling all those responsibilities. It's funny how, or not funny, but it's kind of almost ironic when you think about, um, you know, a student who is you know, doing well academically, doing well, uh, you know, in sports, they may be involved in other activities. And, and of course, from the outside, you look at them and you say, wow, they're the, they're the perfect student, but you never know what's going on inside their mind, right? You never know what they are, like you said, what, what kind of standards they're holding themselves to. And that's where a lot of, we talk about the pressures, it's even almost like it's internal pressure to succeed. Am I right? Absolutely. And, and kids, um, Again, you know, I've had athletes say this to me that, you know, they, if they express that they're struggling, um, then that somehow is a sign that if they, they talk about their struggles, you know, emotionally, mentally, that, that somehow will then reflect on their, the perception of them to be able to perform in their sport. Um, you know, I know we're going to talk about that later about, you know, what, adults can do to support kids. But that is a real concern that, you know, if I do express that I'm struggling mentally or emotionally to my coach or my coach knows what's going on with me, that somehow they'll, they won't think that I'm able to perform on the field or on the court or um, in, a, in a meet. And, and so that, again, they're internalizing even more because they're afraid to say anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too, all that that I've seen my both my daughters were went to Sweet Home, as you know, and mm -hmm. they both perform, you know, were in sports. And and um there were other athletes that certainly were higher level that I'd watch and and it'd be amazing to see well, but then again, you wonder how are they doing? So uh we had a question come through. So um this one would be a good one for both Anne and Kelly. Uh mm -hmm. so who can they turn to for help? Uh, the, the athletes. So, so Kelly, what do you think uh, in terms of the college level? Where would they go for help if they need it? So one of the things we talk to our incoming um, new student athletes about is um, as they're integrating and transitioning to identify a person that they trust. And that could be someone that is in our department, their athletic trainer, um, their academic advisor, someone like myself who is in kind of a neutral role around wellness. It might be somebody across campus, um, somebody that they feel like non-judgmentally that they can go to and share what's really going on. And that from there, um, you know, that we have our staff trained on um, how to then help a student athlete who is struggling with their mental health to get linked to a professional that spe specializes in that area. Um, we continue with messaging and ongoing education for our coaches and our staff and our student athletes um, around the topic of mental health and normalizing it and reducing the stigma. We have a long way to go. Um, but I think the first step is that connection piece. And we know the research supports that tremendously, that it's the more student athletes or students in general feel connected, the more that they tend to thrive. So I think building that trust and um, just letting the students know that it's important for them to find another human um, in, in a professional role on, on our huge campus that they trust. Yeah, that's amazing. Trust is huge, You're right. When you think about um, being comfortable, just talk about how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. that's, that's across the board. But then again, if you're a student athlete, as we talked about before, there's all these expectations. So you feel almost more 
or less of an ability to talk about it because you don't want to show weakness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in terms of just being um, able to, to do what you're asked to do. So, Anne, what do you think? Um, well, if you're talking about kids at the high school level, you know, high schools were, were very fortunate that, that a tide has turned, especially in New York State, where there's such an emphasis on providing mental health supports in schools. So, um, you know, there's, there's many different support people in, in a high school building. School counselor um, is your primary person, not just the person to go to for, to change your schedule or select courses for next year or talk about where you're going to college. A school counselor is someone who is trained in counseling. Um, so that would be a first person of support. Um, school social workers, um, school psychologists in a building. And then as Kelly pointed out, a lot of these kids, you know, they have developed relationships with teachers that they see every single day or a coach, someone that they just that one person that they feel comfortable with um, to open up to if they're struggling. And then maybe that person can take, take them to um, someone that can help more um, sustainable. Um, we also have family support centers like the program I run at Sweet Home, which provides on-site clinical mental health um, services for kids. So we bring the agencies and the private practitioners into the building during the school day so it doesn't affect kids being able to go to practice or being able to go to games. They can get therapy during the school day. And a lot of school districts are now supporting that model, recognizing that it's so important to support a student's mental health. And then there's great organizations in the community. So I try and let kids know all the different layers. I talk about what's immediately available every day in school, but also recognizing that kids might not be comfortable yet reaching out to someone at school. So letting them know what the community resources are, um, like the texting helpline and the Youth Peer Advocates Program at the Mental Health Advocates of Western New York and um, you know crisis services and all of those wonderful supports that are available to kids in the community. Sure. And I just want to mention, too, I'm glad you said resources. Uh, so those who are watching, you can go to our website at letstalkstigma.org and see where these uh, community resources are, where you can find out uh, where you get help. There it is right there. Uh, so this is a question I want to ask you, Nicoletta. This actually came in from our audience. Remember, audience, you can type a question in the chat. We'll get to it. But this is a good question for you because I think it's really um maybe points to where you're at and what you see. So, of course, many Olympic athletes and professional athletes have spoken about their own struggles. How does that help? Has it helped you? Does it, does it, uh, you know, what has it done for you to see people like Michael Phelps or Simone Biles or others talk about their mental health? I think it's very important. It's definitely helpful, especially seeing so important athletes coming forward. It's not someone that, um, Perform, performing in such a high level just puts a different importance into this because since um, a person like Simone Biles coming forward and admitting that herself also has days that she feels weaker, let's say, or feels like she cannot perform as well, this gives confidence to people that are in lower level, to myself, to people in high school, that they're student athletes, um, to come forward and also admit that they're struggling and that they don't feel that they should be something, it, it should be something that they feel embarrassed about because there comes a lot of embarrassment of coming forward and saying, hey, today I don't feel that good uh, because you think that people are going to believe that you're incompetent to perform, to compete and to help your team. But seeing someone like Simone Biles um, withdrawing from such a big competition that you are training for four years to go and do this and, uh, and putting herself first, well, that gives you just inspiration to always put yourself first to come forward and to say it doesn't matter what happens and what the competition is and what the training is, we have to put ourselves first in order to be able to live with ourselves. Because as Kelly said, we're not robots, we're humans. And see someone as successful as Simone Biles just brings a whole different level into the conversation. So I want to follow up, Nicoletta, though, and, and we're here to talk about stigma, right? This is, this is we're talking about the state mm -hmm. of stigma. So. I remember when Simone came out and, and, and really opened up and talked about this and took, took that brief uh, break during the games, there were people that were supportive, but there are other people who were, you know, I didn't use the word haters, but there were people that were, were getting down on her mm -hmm. and, 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 and braiding her almost for what she did. And that's, that's stigma. So, so what do you think that does in terms of just the messaging for younger athletes um, to understand that it's okay, despite 
what people are saying, you know, like how do, how do how did you respond? Because I'm sure you saw some of the negative comments as well that people are saying. What what do you think about that? Well, I think it was very representative of what our society is looking at right now, and in general of how people see athletes. The fact that even someone so prestigious, so prestigious as Simone Biles comes forward, and people are questioning her, questioning her abilities, and this is something that she should not have to um, answer back because she withdrew from the competition. Well, this definitely can be um, very difficult to see athletes that come forward and say, hey, if Simone Biles comes forward and still gets hate, what is going to happen to me if I come forward and speak about my personal struggles? However, to see how she responds back to that, and she just held her ground and then she said, I don't even have to um, prove to you people that actually I struggle with that, but here's a piece of information showing actually that I do struggle with this. It just shows so much strength and gives so much motivation that even if you hear all these negative comments and you're dis discouraged to come forward and speak about it, you should keep going. I, I was a small battles fan before that, but even after this, like she's completely my inspiration when it comes to mental health conversation and dealing with a stigma that comes from talking about mental health struggles. Yeah, I think she's a lot of people's hero, uh, mine as well. Um, so there's another question I have for, for Kelly and for Anne. So are coaches made aware of what to look for? Of course, we know that we were talking about other supports. Coaches certainly are there. So what would you say, Kelly? Are your coaches made aware of what to look for and how they can help? Yeah, so um, we do ongoing um, education for our coaches around mental health. I will say candidly that um, it has not been you know, to the level that it needs to be, and it continues to be at the forefront as far as being a priority um, for us. I think at the collegiate level, it is something within our athletic department that we um, can continue to make a priority. I think in youth sport and, you know, at the grade school and high school level, where you have volunteer coaches or part-time coaches who may not necessarily have that training integrated, is really where we need to spend some time and energy because it's so critically important at those young ages that you know student athletes are getting really consistent healthy messaging about their own athletic identities where sport fits and who they are and what they do keeping perspective understanding um you know that they're beautiful people with amazing bright futures, whether or not they choose to continue to participate in the sport that they're currently involved in. Um, and we can lose sight of that very quickly in a lot of cases. So I think that's really um, definitely at the collegiate level, it's a conversation that's happening daily. Um, our student athletes at UB will tell you that they um, want to see more education for our coaches and our staff. Those are the people that have eyes on them more than anybody else. And so they want to continue to grow that. But I would say in my own work, um, we also need to be looking at um, filling in those gaps for coaches who are, you know, may not necessarily otherwise have access to that training. So what do you say, Anne, at the, at the high school level? Uh, I, I agree with Kelly. I think there needs to be more. I think there is there are some people who have that natural ability to be kind of in tune with things, but but it isn't something that that really has been talked about too much and it has not been integrated into sports or um, really given coaches an opportunity to learn more about it. So um, I think, you know, before we, before we judge, we have to teach and we have to provide people with the information so they know what to look for. Um, the coaches spend a tremendous amount of time with their athletes during the season and beyond. So they do um, have the ability to read kids, maybe more so than, than their teachers or their parents because they're seeing them so much. So really kind of noticing the signs, um, body language, the things that kids don't say, um, really kind of being in tune with that and giving them the skills of, of what to say. Because the other thing that I have found, whether it's working with parents or whether it's working with teachers or other people is sometimes they notice something's off, but they don't know how to address it. They don't know what the words are to say. So giving people those words to say. And one thing, you know, I had an athlete talk about is 
is because of that struggle of not wanting to appear weak with their coach if they do open up you know for a coach to say hey i'm not talking to you as your coach right now i'm talking to you as an adult who cares about you what's going on you know you can talk to me you know i'm, I'm worried about you i noticed this you know is everything okay and maybe the student will open up maybe they won't but they at least know that now someone has noticed and that they care about them in a different way than just performing on the field, that there really is an investment in them as a person and not as an athlete. So I think, you know, that's, those are type, the types of trainings that we have to provide to coaches. We've done some things here at Sweet Home and I've been in talks with our athletic director to offer more um, opportunities. So hopefully that will continue. Excellent. Excellent. And thank you. Uh, so if you're just tuning in, I'm Carl Shalhorn from the Erie County Anti-Sigma Coalition. I'm joined by Ann Nowak, director of the Sweet Home Family Support Center, Kelly Piper, who is assistant athletic director and a sports psychology consultant at the University of Buffalo, and Nicoletta Antonio, uh, captain of the University of Buffalo women's tennis team. Uh, remember, you can visit our website at letstalkstigma.org to take the pledge to end stigma. Also, if you're connected with a business, organization or faith community, you can become an organizational member of the coalition. You can find information for this on the website under the members tab. All right, another question, and I want to point this one to Kelly, because I think, Kelly, you have a, certainly have a um, long uh, perspective on this, long time perspective on this. So has the perspective, this is from the audience, has the importance of winning changed in recent years? And what role does that play with the mental health of athletes? That's a good question. It's a great question and the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> the importance of winning has changed um, and that's directly linked to the increased burnout that student athletes experience. The average age where kids discontinue sport is 12 or 13. So let me just say that one more time. <laughs> the average age that kids choose to discontinue sport is 12 or 13, which is sad to think about um, it's directly linked to us focusing on outcome and uh, rather than what we know when we look at the the true benefits that sport participation can have for young people and what motivates them to continue to engage in sport which is the social support and the camaraderie um, and the teamwork right and the confidence that it can build um, the positive mentorship that comes from great coaches and leaders. And the youth sport model is broken. Um, and so this is really a topic I could probably talk all day about. <laughs> you could probably tell that I'm passionate about it. Um, we need to be better. Um, so I think that's just as much um, the adults having a conversation about, you know, I think parents and coaches that are volunteering at the youth level for the vast majority are extremely well intended and we're also influenced by what society is telling us is important. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, um, I could say startling statistic, 12 to 13, mm -hmm. which actually points to the next question that came from the audience because it kind of dovetails off this. Mm -hmm. um, and so the viewer says, as a parent of student athletes for years, what should we look for when they really don't want to play anymore versus being kids and don't feel like going to practice that day. How can we start the conversation? So maybe uh, Ann uh, and then maybe Kelly, if you want to respond to that. So um, what do you do if your child says, I just don't want to do this now or anymore? Um, how do you know if it's, if it's as you said, Kelly, the burnout, or if it's just they don't want to, you know, maybe, you know, get motivated that one time? Uh, what, what do you look for? I think you you start off by by developing that relationship with your child so they can really talk to you, you know, and and be able to say, hey, what's really going on? Um, Sometimes, and again, it's it's a process, right? Especially, you know, kids when they get to be adolescents, teenagers, they don't want to really. A lot of them don't want to talk to their parents, or or they'll they'll put up that wall, um, and you just be persistent, you know, you just kind of say, look. I'm here, you know, is there something else going on? You know, open that door, put it out there, let them um, have an opportunity to share something if there really is something going on and that they know you're going to listen because this is them, this is their sport, it's not your sport. So be able to let them know they do have a sense of control 
Um, but let's explore this a little bit more before we make a decision. What's really going on? What, what makes you not like it anymore? What makes you not want to play? Um, and see if you can start that conversation. Um, and just, just know that they're, that, you know, your kids may say some things and just listen without judgment. Um, hear what they say, see if you can problem solve. Maybe it's a situation that, you know, kids feel that certain situations are hopeless because they don't have the skills to problem solve completely independently. So offer some potential solutions and then they can make the healthy choice about what they want to do moving forward. Mm. Kelly, anything to add? I, I would just add, I think just, um, you know, paying close attention to patterns or trends that you might notice in, you know, a young person that may or may not be losing interest in their sport. So, you know, if it, you're noticing um, that there's an uptick in anxiety that's more generalized over the course of the day that as you're paying attention as you know, as a parent, you're saying, I think this might have to do with the fact that they're stressed out about going to practice, right? Um, and sort of having those conversations about, you know, all the great things that sport teaches us about commitment and still showing up on the tough days and and all of that, you know. Um, and sometimes it's about going to practice on days when you'd rather kind of sit and play a video game or, you know, kind of hang out and relax or you're tired or, you know, that's those are the days that can teach us who we are. But over the course of, you know, days and weeks, you know, as a parent, knowing your own child, if you're noticing that it can be negatively maybe influencing, you know, and kind of bleeding into other areas of life, right? I think that's a important conversation to be having with them. And then for sure, at the end of a season, right? Or, you know, if there's a good break point in the season, depending on the sport, and whether it's all year long, if they're at the travel level, um, to really be having those conversations about their why, you know, are we continuing to do this because it's it's habit and this is what we're used to doing? Or are we continuing to do this because we're finding joy? Yeah, I like that finding joy. And I also, I also want to say, too, one thing we talk about uh, when it comes to youth and mental health is that if they say, OK, I don't want to play whatever the sport is anymore and they don't replace it with something. Mm -hmm. That's also another key indicator that there may be something going on because, of course, their their interests may change. Uh, that could be something. But if they don't replace the sport and they decide just to drop everything, that could be a red flag. So and I want to get to red flags, later, but I actually want to ask you, Nicoletta, uh, mm -hmm. a question about just as a student athlete, what, what advice would you give to other student athletes about addressing their mental health? How do you do it yourself and what do you tell your teammates? Well, I think that come a long way I've have I've had my ups and downs about mental health and how to handle that um, one of my favorite analogies that I made I've created to make it a little bit easier for other people to understand when it comes to mental health student athletes we always struggle with just admitting that there is a problem because we think that makes us more vulnerable however I would like to make an analogy about athletes and thinking that if you're in the gym and you do exactly the same exercise that the person next to you is doing. And you're doing exactly the same way, the same form, everything is exactly the same, but the only difference is that you're taking more weight into it, like that you lift more, like it's a heavier weight, it's a heavier lift. That makes you more confident that you're better than them physically. It's kind of like this idea that we have, this com competition we have with athletes. But I would like to put this in the mental health standpoint. If you're doing exactly what you're doing the same way as an athlete next to you, exactly the same things, you're, suc you're succeeding exactly the same way, even more than them. And on top of that, you're also struggling with mental health. That doesn't make you weaker. That actually makes you stronger, maybe, than the person next to you. Because there comes so much weight extra with that. And I would like to talk so much more about mental health because this is something that being proud of is maybe a far stretch right now, but I like to advocate even when I struggle because I think that makes me stronger than people actually think. Because if you see a person succeeding getting 4.0 or doing well in matches, they think, as you said, that this is the perfect athlete. And if you add the aspect that perhaps I'm also struggling with anxiety and I still do all of that and I succeed, well, that makes, that makes it even more impressive. So talk about it. 
talk about it even more and don't use it, advocate it as your strength. Don't talk about it as this is something that makes me vulnerable. Go and talk to people that I do this. And on top of that, I also feel bad some days or I, feel, I struggle sometimes. And something else that's very important um, as you as we were discussing earlier about who to turn on, listen to other people's stories as well, because we feel the need to talk about it. And studies have shown that the more we talk about our anxiety and about our struggles, the, the burden just becomes lighter and lighter. So go and talk to people about it. But then also when someone comes and talks to you, whether it's a peer or someone else, be willing to listen to them. And if you feel that this is overwhelming and you do not know how to basically handle the situation, you can just tell them, I'm here for help. I do not know how to help you right now, but don't worry, I'm gonna find the appropriate person to help you and we can go through this together. Wow, you said, you said an awful lot, but that's a great, great bunch of information that you would tell another person who's performing a, a sport. And I mean, the whole idea is, like you said, being able to talk about it. And that is so important when you think about um, just just getting things, as you say, off your chest, right? You know, um, uh, catharsis, we use that term, right? Just getting it out there. So that's really crucial. So um, we have another question for the audience. This is for Kelly. Uh, you talk about these sports be, uh, model being broken. How much of that is a social justice issue where students who have sports support at home and have the financial means to take lessons and pay for travel leagues? So um, I'm trying to understand. Um, so social justice issue uh, where students who have support at home and have the financial means versus you know, take yeah. lessons and, and travel strategies and uh, leagues rather. Got it. So. Yeah. So, so I think, I think that question is, is really pointing to access. Right. Very exactly. access, right. If I'm reading that correctly. Um, Project Play Western New York is an outstanding organization that really focuses on bridging that gap and offering increased access um, for families in the Western New York area across all sports. Um, so I would highly recommend Project Play Western New York. Their website is amazing. Um, and the work that they do is fantastic to address um, some of the disparity. And it absolutely is the case. Um, so I think that, you know, on, on one side of it for young people who don't necessarily have access as often to um, not just, um, you know, athletic facilities and quality use sport experience, but access to um, wellness education in general and healthy lifestyle information in general um, and, you know, positive supports in their life that can model that behavior for them in the, in the schools and after school programs and all of that, which I know, um, you know, that's definitely something that um, even the Buffalo Public Schools, for example, has really focused on like Saturday academies and after school programming. Um, so I think that there is definitely um, it's on people's radars um, at a different level than it used to be. On the flip side of that, I would say for families that do have the access um, or the means to be able to provide, um, you know, extra workouts and private coaches <laughs> um, and, you know, travel teams and all of those things, it's a great blessing um, for a student that has an, an athlete that has access to that. And it also can create a lot of subliminal pressures um, for that young person because they, they pay attention <laughs> to the investment that's being made, um, you know, from those families. And it can create, you know, kind of the subconscious pressure to perform. And if the outcomes aren't there, there's a guilt that can be associated with that too that an athlete may or may not even be aware is going on. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, that was that was really great because, you know, <laughs> you talk about disparities and there are certainly disparities in our society that affect um, uh, different populations that there isn't the access. Like you said, there isn't the ability to have uh, what others do. In the same respect, for those that do have access, they might feel those pressures to perform because yeah, mom and dad to make this investment and all this money to me to go here, to go there, and and then coaches and then private lessons and and I'm not doing well. And now, I mean, what do I do? So yeah, that I think that that creates a sort of a um, issue where the student or the the athlete might feel um, that they let him down. 
right? In a sense, they're disappointing them, which is which is really big. So I have a question. This is for all of you, and maybe we'll start with with Anne. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, different things that they can do. But what about resources? What resources are available? I know um, Kelly just talked about Project Play, I believe it was called. Uh, what other resources are available for, for student athletes? Um, you know, as, as I said, you know, there's there are resources within the school um, for kids to seek out. Um, there are many, you know, we, we do live in a community where there's a lot of mental health um, supports. There's a lot of counseling agencies. There's a lot of private practitioners. Um, we're very fortunate to have access to those things. Um, the one positive thing, not probably the only positive thing, but one of the great things that has come out of COVID is the um, opportunity for telehealth. So there's even more access to services. So for some of our athletes that are in um, the Southern tier or outlying suburbs where there may not be um, uh, as much access in their um, community to mental health services, there is access to something maybe in Erie County or in Buffalo or just by going through telehealth. Um, so there, there are a lot of resources that are available for kids to know about. Um, I know that your, um, your organization um, has all of that information for people to reach out to. I just want to emphasize to athletes is that you are never, ever, ever alone. There is always someone to talk to. There is always someone there to provide support, even when you feel that there's not. Um, there's 24-hour hotlines. There's texting lines. There's, there's people in your, in your building that, you know, if you can just reach out, you know, as Nicoletta said, just reach out. That's all you got to do. Um, and there'll be, you know, a lot of support. I think that we just need to also make sure as educational institutions to be providing that information on a regular basis to kids. And d the destigmatization of asking for help is huge. We have to do that more. We have to do it all the time. Um, we have to start when kids are in preschool and in kindergarten and letting them know it's okay to talk about their feelings and it's okay to um, express themselves and give them the tools to do it positively and in a healthy way. Um, there's definitely that responsibility, but you know, sometimes kids don't feel that there is anybody there and we've got to make sure we're getting that information to them that there is. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Nicoletta, what, what would you say to your peers uh, about resources that you're aware of? Well, through um, University of Buffalo, but I'm sure that all uh, universities have that, um, there is free access to counseling services. And as Anne said, it is very good now that there is um, uh, teletherapy. So mm -hmm. even, even myself, um, through this year, it has been so much easier because of COVID to get in touch with um, a counselor through Zoom. And it makes it so much easier. And for a person, for example, that they feel a little bit more... Um, uncomfortable talking to someone in person or getting there. It is so much easier from doing it from your comfort of your own home. You can literally do a therapy in your own bed that this is the familiar space. So in case you need anything, you're right there next to your closest people in a place that you know. Um, there are many, um, I think Kelly can talk a little bit more about this. There are self-help resources online as well that you can take some workshops um, that you can reflect a little bit more that you can do a lot more mindfulness. Something that um, I have been practicing a lot more is some um, self meditation and mindfulness practices. And uh, they have been really helpful with just breathing exercises. There are apps out there that literally uh, they can teach you how to properly breathe, I'll say in another way, like you can have someone that can guide you through some breathing exercises for meditation, even uh, help you through sleep because that's another a uh, big issue, especially with athletes. Sometimes we have so much energy that we cannot get ourselves to sleep. Um, so getting those apps um, that can help you basically calm you enough down to go to sleep. And I think there are yoga classes, Pilates classes, so many classes that can focus on activating your body while also paying attention to your inner processes, thoughts, and feelings. I like that. And when you talk about the idea of using um, and things like meditation apps, those things weren't even around. Even I'd say eight, 10 years ago. So there are a lot of tools, great tools. Kelly, what would you add as far as resources for athletes? I think just building off of that, I would say the self-care piece is, is just really, really important. And um, 
really all that means is is you know prioritizing um, whether it is you know specifically therapy, um, whether it is effective coping mechanisms, whether it's um, you know using an app, um, you know building in um, some time throughout the day to journal, um, draw, do something that's off of a screen um, that can allow you to you know cope in a healthy way, you know find um, you know resources can be things that you identify that allow you to come back to center, you know, um, and maybe having those conversations again with the people that you trust about, you know, um, your own self-awareness about what makes you happy. So if it's walking your dog or baking or, um, you know, spending time with family or whatever that looks like, being able to, you know, just do what's gonna fill your cup up in order to kind of bring things back to center in your perspective. Yeah, I like that. Fill your cup up because you can't you can't uh, exist when your cup's empty, yeah, or when the wells run dry, right? As they say. Um, so Anne and Kelly, I'm, I've referred to the term red flags before, and we did ask what coaches should look for, but what should a parent look for uh, if they have a student athlete? Of course, you know, Kelly, I'm sure there are athletes that are away from home. Certainly, Nicola, a year away from home, but if a student is at still living at home, uh, what should a parent look for? Um, I think that, you know, as, as Kelly, you know, had mentioned, like that change in behavior over a period of time, you know, there's, there's definitely a difference between situational sadness and, and, you know, potential depression. So if you see that your kids, um, you know, have lost interest in the things that, that, you know, they once found joy in, in whether it's sports and they're, and they're pushing back about participating or hanging out with their friends or other or participating in other extracurricular activities. If you see them, you know, increasing in sleep or not sleeping at all, if there's a change in their appetite, um, whether they're they're eating a lot or they or they're not eating, increase in somatic, you know, in in physical complaints, you know, frequently saying that they have headaches or stomach aches, you know, those can be symptoms of a physical problem, but we also know directly related to stress that that headaches and stomach aches and those types of things can be caused directly by stress. Um, if your kids, you know, their mood, they're more withdrawn, you know, they're not as talkative, um, things like that, you know, parents are the experts on their kids. And I know parents of teenagers don't ever really feel like that, um, but you are. So, so trusting your gut, trusting your instincts, you know, when you notice something, when you see something, say something, you know, acknowledge that, do a check-in, tell your child that you've noticed that, you know, and you give them a list of the things that you've seen that you're concerned about. Is there something going on? What's happening? Certainly academically, a change in their academic performance, their grades, um, comments from teachers, you know, those are the things that that are definitely all red flags that you need to kind of do some follow up, whether it's with a medical professional or whether it's with the school counselor or, or, you know, with anybody, but just to keep those eyes out. Excellent. So Nicolette, I want to throw the last question to you as far as, you know, we talked a lot of reasons why student athletes don't seek help. Um, and, and we just know is, I guess the question is, is it more than just a stigma? I mean, there may be other reasons why they don't seek help. So from your perspective, why don't your peers seek help? Um, I think obviously the stigma is a big one. Another thing is that perhaps they don't feel comfortable even within themselves to open up for those things. Uh, there are people that they're more eager to talk about their feelings and their thoughts um, to others and to themselves. But when you go to a professional and you say something is wrong, perhaps you're so scared about what you're gonna find out later and that you don't know yourself that much. And I think everyone, regardless of an age, regardless of what they're doing, there's so, there, there is this kind of feeling, maybe there's more around me that I understand and I'm not ready to find this out yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big piece, I think. Um, stigma definitely for me is the biggest one, especially with athletes. Um, 
talking to a coach, perhaps um, saying that you might need some help, they will make them think that, that's, that you may not be able to compete this weekend and they're going to take you out of um, the lineup or they're going to take you out of the um, a chance to play or telling your friends that, okay, I'm, I, I'm talking personally, even when I was um, with a sports psychologist back in Greece and it's a sports psychologist, I literally went there just for sports. People would ask me questions like, oh, what what's going on? Are you not feeling well? Are you... Like, what is the reason? There was so much questioning, even though by the title, literally, I was going there for sports. Um, and there's so much stigma, even within our peers. It's not just about the community. It's about you're scared that someone is going to look at you. Tell them that. So it's definitely very difficult, but it's so worth it because everybody should go to just figure out themselves a little bit more. And we're never fully aware of what's going on inside us. And someone else can help us understand that by giving us an objective view. Thank you. And of course, as you said before, make sure you try to just find your voice, right? Find your voice and, and speak up. That's an excellent piece of advice there. So um, we're almost out of time, but I do want to give you each an opportunity to kind of give some concluding comments or remarks on our discussion today. I want to thank you all for being here. So, uh, to Anne, why don't we start with you? Any last closing comments before we wrap up? Um, no, I just want to, you know, really just emphasize the need to do a better job, you know, as a society and, and it's supporting kids, telling them that it's okay to talk about their feelings, that it's okay that um, they can share what's going on and just be that person and be attentive. And if you notice that you have a student who's off, you have noticed a student that may be pushing themselves too hard. You know, that's the other thing that some of the athletes do is that trying to find that balance between pushing through something, which they're taught to do when you're playing a sport, um, but that you don't have to push through everything and that there, there are times where it's okay to um, admit that you that you're struggling. Excellent. That's that's really important to. It's okay to not be okay, like I said before, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Kelly, uh, closing comments. Um, I think it's important to to have a conversation with student athletes about who they are outside of sport, and and having the conversation about, you know, if if sport was not part of your life, who are you? You know, what are your goals? Um, what are the other pieces of your identity that are exciting and fulfilling? Um, and, and to just continue to kind of move the needle on having some balance on where sport participation sits for us and where mm -hmm. athletic identity fits into you know, our overall identity to help just kind of keep perspective on um, you know, what's important and um, not having that athletic identity be such an overarching and sometimes unhealthy piece of, of who an athlete feels like they are. Thank you for that. I, I like the word balance, right? Balance is important. And just being well-rounded. I know that's almost a cliche, but being someone who is, surely you're an athlete, but there are other parts of your life as well to, to uh, you know, enjoy and to grow and develop. Because we're talking about young people and they are changing as we, you know, as they speak, so to speak. So um, Nicoletta, last comments from you. Um, well, I would say that for parents um, of student athletes and even student athletes themselves, give them options. Give them the option that if they don't feel like this is what they want to do anymore, then it's okay. They can find something else um, to be striving towards. I remember at some point on my age, I was not, I'm like younger, I wasn't sure I wanted to continue playing tennis. And I, my parents were very supportive. And if you don't want to do this, then let's focus on something else. But let's replace it, as we said, with something else. Um, something really important to remember is that it is more likely for athletes to develop mental health disorder, mental health illness. The studies show that. So there's no shame in that because actually it is more likely that we're going to struggle with that. So remember this going forward. Parents don't freak out if this happens. That's okay. Like It, it doesn't mean that it can go the worst way possible. Keep a communication open with your um, children, with student athletes, and most importantly, let's normalize the conversation. It is important to come forward and speak more and more about it until it's the same as physical health. That is the goal, right? Thank you. And I like that term normalize. We talk about that a lot in our community. 
uh, behavioral health. So thank you everyone for being here. As a reminder, we need you, the audience, to take the pledge and stigma by going to our website at letstalkstigma.org. If your organization would like to join us in our cause, there's information on the website as well. Just click on the members tab to find out how. Together, we can all make this happen. So once again, I'd like to thank our panelists, Ann Nowak, Kelly Piper, and Nicoletta Antonio. I'd like to thank the folks behind the scenes, Mike Telesco from Telesco Creative Group for all of his technical support, Matt Smith, Chair of the Anti-Sigma Outreach Committee, and Carol Doggett from the Mental Health Advocates West New York, and Karen Karaszewski from KKPR Buffalo for their support as well. Be sure to tune in to our next Facebook Live event on March 16th, where we will be focusing on the state of stigma, our mental health concerns contributing to healthcare worker burnout. So on behalf of the Erie County Anti-Sigma Coalition, until next time, I'm Carl Shalahorn. Be well.